Welcome. I understand uh, the senator is going to be in place in just a minute. They're um, uh, setting him up um, in Congress. So uh, in the minute or two that it will take for him to get there, uh, let me welcome everybody. I'm um, glad to come to these each year. It's really uh, an important conversation to keep happening, um, even only if only from the standpoint of not normalizing what I think we all agree uh, has been made tragically normal. One of the things that uh, I often think about is we uh, sometimes look in our um, anthropology books at uh, ancient cultures, and we marvel at certain practices, human sacrifice in particular. Why would you sacrifice someone in order to bring in a crop? Why would you do this over and over and over again? What sadly mistaken beliefs they had? What terrible tragedy uh, went on for, for years and years and years? And of course, you wonder what future anthropologists will think about us, uh, look back and say, how could they year after year uh, allow these things to happen? Um, you know, Senator Murphy in particular uh, comes from uh, Connecticut. In fact, uh, he was first elected uh, shortly before the Sandy Hook massacre. Uh, and so his, uh, th this, that portion of his career has really sort of been um, dedicated or uh, characterized by a lot of effort that he has done um, in this area. And uh, we're going to get an update from him when he joins us in just a minute. Um, he's good? OK, great. Senator Murphy, are you there? So much for having me. So much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, you, um, I was just uh, telling the folks here that you, uh, of course, uh, both as a first, I guess, as a state legislator, then as a member of Congress, and now as a senator, um, have been uh, active on many of these issues, and in particular, the Sandy Hook massacre, uh, where uh, 21st graders and six of their teachers were killed in 2012, uh, led to a, a lot of activity. And I wanted to ask you in particular about your bill, your signature bill, the Background Check Expansion Act, which has been introduced in every Congress since 2017. This would require background checks for uh, transfer and sale of firearms, including online, at gun shows, unlicensed sellers. All of the polls say that it is popular, but uh, you've introduced it over and over, in part because the support has not been there. Could you give us an update on where things stand, and could this be the year that it passes? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm such a big admirer of the work that Northwell has done to really give a forum for healthcare professionals and providers to uh, speak up on this issue. Obviously, the uh, epidemic of gun violence in this nation is undoubtedly a public health epidemic, um, and there's you know, no way to really categorize how many lives are, are lost and affected um, by uh, this, this carnage. Um, so, you know, this is the holy grail of gun policy, universal background checks, as you mentioned, wildly popular, you know, polls suggest 80, 90, 95% of Americans think that every gun sale should come with a background check. The background checks, they're called instant because they are instant. They almost always take, you know, five minutes. Uh, if they don't take five minutes, it's likely because you've got something in your history that, you know, is cause for concern. Um, it's also probably the most impactful policy if you take a look at states that have universal background checks, there's much, much lower rates of gun violence, lower rates of homicide, lower rates of domestic violence, lower rates of suicide. Um, the prospect for passage this year of the you know, full you know, universal background check legislation, um, you know, I don't know, I'd say it's low, but it's a challenge given the control of the House by Republicans. But as you know, and I hope you've talked about during this event, uh, we obviously um, finally broke through last year and passed uh, the first significant anti-gun violence measure in 30 years. Uh, and uh, that law, which does involve additional background checks, does involve strengthening the background check system, is saving lives as we speak. And you know, 40 days before that bill passed, no one would have given you know, uh, any chance for significant anti-gun violence legislation to pass the Congress in 2022, and yet it happened. So I don't um, ever want to sort of give odds um, on whether or not we can pass this legislation, because I think we you know, constantly surprise folks, be, especially in an environment today where finally 
the uh, anti-gun violence movement is more powerful than the gun lobby. And it took us 10 long years since Sandy Hook to um, uh, really achieve uh, a parity of power. And now I think we um, have the balance of power on the side of change. Um, and I think that will allow us to get a lot more done, whether or not we get that exact bill done or some piece of it or some version of it in 2023, I don't know yet. What can you um, share with us about the, uh, the pro process of, of making change over the years? I'm, I'm thinking in particular about some of what you just m mentioned, the, the, the breakthrough legislation that happened last year somewhat unexpectedly, this largest ever investment in gun violence research and prevention, um, the, the bipartisan nature of it even, uh, tell, take us behind the scenes a little bit, and wh what do you want us to know about how all of this really works? Well, there was this popular theme after Sandy Hook and after the failure of the background checks measure to pass uh, in early 2013. The theme was, you know, well, once this country decided uh, to do nothing after 21st graders were killed, that was the end of the conversation on gun violence. And I completely understand that sentiment. A lot of people sort of looked at Sandy Hook and said, if that didn't change Congress's mind, nothing will. Um, unfortunately, I think that's a really inaccurate and naive view of American politics. The fact of the matter is there are very few 180 degree turns in American politics. There are very few epiphany moments. Um, American politics is about power. It's about political infrastructure. And in 2013, in the wake of Sandy Hook, the gun lobby had tons of power, had a huge political infrastructure. And the anti-gun violence movement had zero power, had almost no infrastructure. It was um, the, the Brady campaign and nobody else. But in the 10 years since, we have built up an infrastructure. Um, organizations have popped up that are now enormous and powerful, like Moms Demand Action, Everytown, Giffords, Students Demand Action, March for Our Lives, such that now we have a larger voice than the gun lobby does. When you show up at a town hall meeting prior to 2023, prior to 2012, and somebody st stood up and said, I want to talk to you about guns, you knew exactly what that person was going to talk about. They were going to talk about protecting the Second Amendment, expanding gun rights. Now, if somebody stands up at your town hall, whether you're in Connecticut or Wyoming, and says, I want to talk to you about guns, the chances are they're talking about strengthening our gun laws. And you saw that after Uvalde, when we were starting to debate the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, um, a senator from Wyoming said, uh, you know what? Calls are running 10 to one in my office in favor of this legislation. I'm gonna have to give it a look. Now, she ended up voting against the legislation, but uh, that's the, the measure of our movement. Our movement now, is putting Republicans in a position where they fear voting against bills like the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act more than they fear voting for them because they know there's going to be a price to be paid back home from parents, from young voters, uh, if they continue to side with the NRA. That is what our movement has done over the last 10 years, and that is what put us in the position to be able to pass the legislation uh, last summer. Moving beyond um, process, what is most exciting to you about the bill? Um, what would uh, strengthened background checks mean? What will you be looking for in terms of impact and consequences? Uh, about the, the, the bill, uh, the comprehensive background checks bill, or about the bill we passed last year? Exactly, yes. The, uh, the Background Check Expansion Act. Yeah, well, I mean, first, let's just take a second to talk about what happened to background checks in the legislation we passed last year. So uh, last year, we expanded the background check system to cover all domestic violence crimes. So now if you are convicted of a felony or misdemeanor domestic violence crime, you cannot buy a gun, you cannot possess guns. Uh, we, ex we created a whole new background check system for younger buyers. So now in this country, if you are 18, 19, or 20 years old and you go to buy a gun, you have an enhanced background check and a waiting period. Nobody walks out of a gun store with a gun if you are under 21 in this country. And that cooling down period is very important. That enhanced background check includes a phone call to the local police department. Um, and that already has stopped many, many young people in crisis from buying guns because the police department says, wait a second, I know that kid. That kid is right now in mental health crisis. They shouldn't have a gun. That sale can be stopped. 
And then we change the definition of who has to be licensed as a gun dealer. So now we have a lot more uh, individuals who are selling a lot of guns at gun shows and online that have to license as, themselves as gun dealers and have to perform background checks. So the legislation last year is um, the most important improvement in our background check system in 30 years. So we should stop and celebrate that. At the same time, what we're trying to do now is have a national floor for background checks. What the bill I introduced does is say, um, no matter where you sell a gun in this country, um, you've got to do a background check. And that's important to everybody in the nation because even in states like Connecticut or New York or Illinois that already have state laws requiring universal background checks, increasingly the crime guns that are used in New York City or Hartford or New Haven, they come from the states that don't have universal background checks. So um, creating that floor where every gun purchase, no matter where you buy a gun, has to come with a background check. It protects everybody in the country, not just the citizens of those states. And so that's why even coming from a state with universal background checks, I'm interested in requiring that every state perform background checks on every commercial sale because that interrupts the flow of illegal guns into Connecticut. Okay. L last year, the uh, families of nine Sandy Hook victims um, reached a $73 million settlement in a lawsuit against the maker of the rifle that was used in the, in the shooting. And the families and one survivor argued that Remington should never have sold such a dangerous weapon to the public. Is that a fruitful strategy, a kind of a products liability strategy to explore, to, to leverage change? It, it absolutely is. Uh, and it proved that the legislation passed in the 2000s at the behest of the gun lobby, giving them sort of broad liability protection is not complete, uh, is not total. There are still lots of opportunities to hold these companies accountable for their reprehensible marketing tactics. Um, we just did a press conference a couple of weeks ago uh, on a sort of new development, which is gun companies marketing to children, like eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds. There's a product on the market today called the JR-15, the Junior AR-15. Um, and literally the advertisements show little kids as the target of advertising, despite the fact that little kids are not allowed to buy guns in this country. That's a clear violation of existing federal trade law. Uh, and we're encouraging the FTC to crack down on that practice. Just today, I got forwarded to me an advertisement by Smith & Wesson, which uh, advertises um, how um, useful weapons are to right-wing extremists. Um, literally, it's a picture of a proud boy um, carrying a Smith & Wesson rifle. Clearly, these gun companies are marketing weapons to groups that are engaged in the attempted overthrow of the federal government. They need to be held accountable for that. So broadly, the marketing practices of the industry um, are reprehensible at times. Uh, and the court system uh, and the federal regulatory system are undoubtedly a, a means to crack down on those um, marketing practices that fall out of bounds. And then uh, finally, Senator, your office has worked with the healthcare community in the past. As you look ahead, how might leaders in healthcare and business work on the gun violence issue in the future? Uh, give some marching orders to the folks who are watching here. Well, you know, if you look at um, prior great social change movements, and I really think the anti-gun violence movement is a great social change movement. I think it'll go down in history books side by side with, you know, the marriage equality movement, the civil rights movement. Um, you know, those movements um, were aided by private sector support. The marriage equality movement, for instance, probably one of the most important things that happened in the marriage equality movement was companies making decisions, for instance, to you know, give same-sex couples the same health care benefits uh, as opposite-sex couples. Um, the civil rights movement aided by private companies that stepped forward and added their voice to that of Martin Luther King and others. Um, we need the private sector to do the same thing here. Um, I think there's a lot of folks out there in the private sector. There are a lot of healthcare providers that think, oh, you know what, the issue of guns, it's too politically hot. Yeah, I just can't touch this one. It's just not true. The American public has made up their mind on the issue of gun violence. 90% of Americans support universal background checks. Um, there's nothing else that pulls at 90% in American politics today. In fact, outside of politics, apple pie, kittens, baseball, 
none of them poll at 90%. So you take zero political risk as a healthcare provider or as a business by standing up for universal background checks in this country. Um, and increasingly, even things that used to be more controversial, like a ban on assault weapons, enjoys broad popular support. That's why President Biden talks about assault weapons all the time. It's because he knows it's a political winner. So I just think healthcare providers have a moral obligation to talk about this issue. That's why you're convening this meeting. Um, but businesses do as well, because you know the number of kids in this country um, who are having their economic futures obliterated by gun violence is extraordinary. I went to um, a middle school in my neighborhood in the south end of Hartford uh, a couple months ago to talk to some student leaders about you know what mattered to them. And what they wanted to talk to me about without any prompting was their walk to and from school. They wanted to talk to me about how much fear every single day came through their walk to school and their walk home from school. Those kids are experiencing a level of trauma that corrupts their brain, that makes their brain unable to, uh, to, to advance, to learn, to grow. Um, and for our business community, um, think about all of the potential innovators, all of the potential workforce um, that is being robbed from you because there are millions of children growing up in violent neighborhoods who are unable to learn, unable to thrive because of uh, exposure to gun violence. So I think this is a clear mandate for healthcare professionals and the private sector. And I think everybody needs to step up, stop being so scared of this issue uh, and raise your voice. Okay, that brings us to the end of our time. Thank you so much, Senator Murphy. Thank you.